Investors Chronicle. Hello again and welcome to Lee and the IC. I'm Alex Newman, an Associate Editor at the Investors Chronicle, and I'm back once again in the FT studios in the company of Lord John Lee. John, how are you? Fine, thank you. This is our sixth episode, but as always, I need to start with the disclaimer that everything we talk about on this podcast is for educational purposes, though hopefully it makes for an entertaining listen too. And none of it should be taken as financial advice or recommendation to buy or sell shares. This month, we're doing things a little bit differently. As normal, John and I will be taking a deep dive into one of his portfolio holdings. But to help with that and open up the conversation into broader matters of shareholder engagement, we are going to be speaking to the chief executive of that company. And that company is the AIM Listed Concurrent Technologies, whose CEO, Dr. Mars Adcock, is, I'm very happy to say, in the studio with us today. So it's two interviews and a discussion, all for the same normal price. Miles, thanks so much for joining us today. You're welcome. I know John, like some people listening into this, will be very familiar with your company. But for those who don't know the business very well, might be new to Concurrent, might be hearing it for the first time, can I just ask you to briefly outline what Concurrent does? Who are your customers? What problems you're trying to solve for them? Absolutely. So the company was formed in 1985 to do one thing, and that was take Intel processors, which were pretty novel then, Uh, and integrate them into computers. So if you think of a processor back then, it may have had just a handful of pins, the little legs that come out of a processor, and then our job was to connect those little legs to memory and comms and all the other things that make a computer. And the target customer base were people who had particularly exacting needs for environmental robustness or particularly high levels of performance. Roll forward to 2024... And rather than a handful of pins on an Intel processor, there are thousands. So the core competence of this business is to take those thousands of pins and in a very small space create a very high-end computer with literally thousands of components targeted at customers who, yes, want the highest performance but have very exacting requirements around architectures, um, the the long-term viability of that product, so they get exactly the same product on year 10 as they might on day one, uh, and very harsh environmental requirements. That is typically but not always defence. Mm. So uh, defence being the dominant sector you, you service, I think the last update you put out, it was around around three quarters of, of, of sales, though there are other areas including telecoms and, and medical. I, I think the big change in your offering since you joined the company has has been a move from product-based solutions. You talk, I think, sometimes about cards um, or boards, the the hardware that you're, you're putting together for your clients to what you've called services-based solutions. Can you just out, outline what this means? What What is the nature of the change you, you've been trying to introduce? Yes. So for 36 years, the company did that one thing. They right. made computer boards that plugged into slots and other people's products plugged into slots nearby, for example, graphics cards or memory or storage. Uh, And when I joined, we were actually pretty late to market with our core product. So our our strategy has two very simple themes. Get back to being really good at being on time, early to market with the very latest technology in customers' hands. We've made great progress there. And then the second strand is actually our computer boards plug into things that we call systems. So there are other people's boards alongside ours, and then they're all in a rather complex box, a chassis, which is often custom to what the customer requires rather than more of a commercial off-the-shelf product. And the acquisition we made in September, in particular, as a systems integrator, gives us the ability to say to a customer, what's the application you're trying to run? What are you trying to achieve in, for example, your vehicle or your radar or your medical instrument? And we can give you the entire solution, not just sell you a computer. Mm. That was Philips Aerospace, the... Correct. The acquisition, okay. So... uh, just to sort of tie tie things in a little bit to the financials, obviously we're going to unpack all of this in greater depth. 2022 was your first full year in the job. That was characterised by, and you know, this this isn't a wasn't a theme unique to concurrent. It was quite broad across your industry. It was characterised by shortages of components, which 
see, hurt the share price a bit and also your ability to meet demand in the market. Can you bring us up to speed on you know, the status of the supply chain, how it's currently affecting working capital and, and, and your trading more? Yes, of course. So I joined mid-21. Yeah. Uh, by autumn 21, I'd laid out this, this strategy for developing a, a much more capable core business, but also getting into these things called systems. That implied quite a lot of investment. And then early 2022, it became really apparent the world was going through a global component shortage. What many people chose to do at that time, perhaps understandably, is cut costs to maintain in-year profits. Uh, We stuck to our guns in terms of investing in the company to really upgrade the capability of what the business was capable of. For example, more than two-thirds of our employees started after I did. So we really leaned in to transforming the company. So yes, components were a massive problem in 2022. Dropped revenue actually about 10% on a typical prior year. So not enormously, but of course we'd grown the cost base. So 2022 was uh, not much better than a break even year in terms of profit, but we maintained investing. As we come into 2023, by mid-year, the supply chains have eased significantly, mid-23. So we already enjoyed our strongest ever half one, but that was still, frankly, hard yards in terms of replaying the factory based on what components happened to be available. Our inventory holdings went up substantially. Uh, But through half two, we were able to ship to the maximum of our capacity. We've doubled our ability to generate product in our Colchester-based factory. We have the ability to increase capacity uh, yet again. And as we're in 2024, supply chains are virtually back to normal, certainly not something that I'm currently concerned about. Just to put a couple of numbers on that that you've disclosed on, on those figures, the first half of 2023... You had results out. Your interims stated that sales were t- just over twelve million yep. pounds. Correct. And then your latest trading update has said that your revenue should, for the full year should exceed thirty million. So, you know, you've generated as much in sales in the second half as you did in the entirety of the previous year or there thereabouts. Correct. Can you just shed a little bit more light? I know you unpacked it a little bit there for me, but the, was it just pent up demand or was it the new acquisition? What was, how do we, how do we understand that? No, the, it was not the new acquisition. Our sales yeah. cycles are very long. So okay. the new acquisition does very little to our short term financial performance. Okay. Uh, on my first day with this fantastic company, our sales lead said to me, Miles, I have nothing to sell. Um, and that was representative of a product portfolio that was a little old in the tooth. I talked earlier about how complex this technology is. Designing a product and taking it to market is really tough. And I think the company had got to the limit of its ability to do that as a very small company with, if you like, small company tools and practices. So we did two things in particular. We added a lot of new talent into the design team. uh, And with that, we had to do scalable work around processes, tools of the trade, all these things. So completely redesigned how we design our products. And we upgraded much of the sales team. So historically, we've largely farmed based on people who happen to know us wanting to use us again. Uh, We hired some of the best known salespeople from our competitors uh, and are much more assertive in the marketplace. In 2021, 80% of our orders were for last time buy or end of life product. So that that is a portfolio really running out of road. In 2022 and maintained in 23, we flipped that. So 80% of the purchase orders placed on us were for what we designate new or current product. That that's probably the most important thing to understand about the transformation that we have been through. Um, and order intake, you know, 2022 order intake was in excess of 30 million from a background of typically being around 20. So we're starting to see the order intake really reflect us leaning into both better, newer, on-time products and a refreshed sales team. I suppose the, the product suite and its longevity is obviously one one factor that investors are often going to look at when, when looking at, I suppose, engineering or defence businesses. The other one is the concentration of your customer base. Can you talk a little bit about there? That's sometimes that's sometimes a fear, either for, for a company of your size or or just the nature of, of, of defence work, that actually you are dependent on uh, yeah, a, 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 a lower number of, of contracts than you might 
otherwise want? What is your the kind of breakup of your uh, contracting? So two years ago, a very common question asked of me by investors was, your single biggest order is with uh, a Malaysian communications company representing around 10% of our revenue. What if you don't get that? What, what if that tails off? To which my response was, well, our job is to add five or six customers of that scale per annum and plan for one or two dropping off. That, that's trite and easily said, but it's actually what we've done. Right. So indeed, last year, we derived no revenue from that comms customer. It did indeed drop off, uh, but you can't tell that from our numbers. And as you pointed out, the market is currently expecting us to be up by about 60% year on year between 22 and 23. We, we are a small company in what is a very large market. So re-engineering this company so that it can compete like for like for, against other companies who may be hundreds of millions or perhaps even billions of dollars in size is what it's all about. And there are lots of those opportunities out there if you have the right product. John, I'd like to perhaps uh, belatedly bring you in, um, if I may. You've said before in this podcast that you're you're holding in concurrent predates Miles' appointment in 2021. What initially drew you then to this this company? Well, I was looking back last night, actually, as to when I first came aboard concurrent, and I think it was about uh, 2009. Okay. Uh, when the company obviously was, uh, uh, was smaller uh, and um, was run by a chap called Glenn Fawcett who'd really built it up. And I like the you know the the business. It it, it ticked uh, all the boxes for me. You know, it looked a good. It was a good, solid, established, small cap, paying a nice dividend. Uh, it was cash rich, and it, it seemed to me to to be in a niche area that, as far as I could tell, um, gave the company a, a certain value. And uh, you know, I I tend to be loyal to the companies I invest in, so I I stayed with it, and I got to know Glenn well, and um, who can be sure, but I think his, his plan and end game uh, was to build the business to a certain size and then probably prepare it for a takeover, maybe for, by a US company. I think that was my assessment, although, of course, it was never quite uh, confirmed in that sense. But, of course, you know, I've not got the, the, the knowledge uh, to to really assess the quality of the the product or the speed of delivery to market, so this is the disadvantage of of uh, an amateur investor like myself, as it were. So you take a certain amount on uh, on trust, and then of course uh, what happened was that Glenn died, mm. uh, and um, twenty nineteen was it? Uh, sorry, it was in twenty nineteen. Yes, yeah. uh, Glenn died, uh, and um, the business was on a little bit of a plateau at that mm. stage, as far as I was concerned. And Miles came in, uh, and um, I made it my business to to meet Miles fairly early on, mm. and uh, he was coming in, of course, from a you know from a, a much larger industry background mm. and it was quite clear to me that that he was you know in the in the nicest way you know ambitious and wanted to really um uh, make his mark with concurrent it was going to be you know his baby as it were which he was going to devote the next stages of his life to you know i knew that he had big plans to change things uh, and change would be you know would be expensive uh, and there may well have been an, an interregnum period uh, and indeed, there was, of course, and it was compounded by the the shortage of um, uh, of components. So the business went through a difficult period and passed the dividend, and there was some restating of, um, of figures as well. But I had faith in in the company, and particularly in uh, Miles's vision. And uh, you know, I I now feel that the company, uh, as far as I'm aware. And hopefully, um, what Miles is saying will confirm this is really on the runway, as it were, for much bigger things over the next, you know, two, three, four, five years, and and onwards. So I'm very much aboard and staying aboard. It's a significant holding of mine, and um, you know, one that I'm I'm proud to be associated with. So a few strands I'd, I'd I'd really like to come back to there in a moment, but um, I just wanted to just take a step back. I mean, I received an email from from one listener. Um, after we flagged that we were going to be speaking to Miles um, for this episode, he wanted to know what led you to keep the faith in the business in that transition period after after Glenn's death and prior to Miles' appointment. Because obviously, you know, we had a pandemic. That was a, a, a major event for for you know every 
every holding in your portfolio. But you obviously weren't to know Mars' strategy in advance, and there was a period there where where things were, you know, in in transition. Was it a nervous time? Well, I think the I think the the, the jury was out yeah. at that stage. But I wasn't unduly worried because yeah. you know it was a solid little business. It had mm. quite a lot of cash. Yeah, uh, it obviously had a market position. And, uh, you know, I saw no reason to, you know, to sort of cut and run. Uh, and if anything, I probably built up my holding during that period. Uh, but, you know, as an outside investor, you, you you always have to take a certain amount on trust and, and you never get it right every time. And, of course, the other point is that I tend to build up fairly large holdings in small cap stocks. So, therefore, you know, I can't easily exit uh, a company just like that, as it were, uh, so, you know, for me, staying aboard was, was, you know, no particular concern. And obviously, then I was very encouraged that I had done when I met Miles and, and um, you know, he, he broadly spelt out his, his, um, his philosophy and approach. On that trust point as well, and you, you, you did refer to this before, when I sort of reading up on your, your product smiles ahead of this, you know, they'll look very, very impressive. But it's, I suppose, like John, it's very, very hard for me, a complete non-specialist in electronics and computing, to understand, you know, A, what they do really, B, who they're for, C, the intensity of the competition within this particular niche. Actually, maybe, John, I can just put the question to you and then I'll, I'll sort of also turn it to you as well, Miles. I mean, how, how do you navigate these these unknowns then, John, is it what, what are you looking for in the statements that a concurrent is, is, is put in? When you're aboard a, a particular company mm-hmm. uh, and invested for the long term, as I am, you, 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 uh, you understand the language of that company and you know, what the chief executive or the chairman is saying. And therefore, the, the, the use of particular words okay. is important and it conveys a certain, uh, a certain message. So obviously, one is looking for a degree of uh, a degree of optimism. Very broad brush. It did seem to me that that the company was in some you know some exciting growth areas. Uh, they had a very good relationship from memory. I think with Lockheed Martin. I think um, the company was a, a, a silver supplier or whatever the uh, you know the, the phrase was, uh, acknowledging a certain sort of quality. Uh, and then, of course, you know, increasingly one became aware that. Uh, um, defense was very much uh, has become a very much a you know a growth a growth sector post uh, world developments i i just think that uh, as far as i'm aware anyway the the company is well positioned uh, and assuming miles gets most things right and no one's going to get everything right as it were <laughs> i think there is a, a you know a very attractive uh, growth period ahead and uh, you know it, it's it's um, a strong holding of mine and, um, you know, one that I think hopefully over the next few years will be one of my best performers. Yeah. Miles, if I can if I can turn back to you, I mean, the, I suppose the nature of your business, it's not only the technical aspects of the, 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 the products you have, but also there's obviously there's clear sensitivities around, you know, your contracting, the sectors you're providing to. When, you know, whether it's institutional or retail investor, how do you how do you put forward your the the investment case given all of the above you know it's not it's not just like i suppose the 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 investment case isn't as clear as as greg's you know some businesses we see the demand with our own eyes we experience it we know it we've got a very good sense of 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 what the proposition is what do you have to do to 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 really spell out the investment case clearly so it's understood in the market so if you think about our customers they're often large defense primes that you would have heard of Raytheon, BA Systems, Lockheed Martin, yeah. people like this. And uh, as you might imagine in defence, there is an ever-growing need for intense computing capability. If you take a vehicle, for example, the amount of computing power in a vehicle now to understand what's going on around it, how to protect itself, to communicate, to navigate, uh, is, is just intense. And a trend in defence is to put as much computing as possible at what they call the edge. So rather than sending lots of data back to some base, don't want to do that anymore because of cybersecurity and latency and things like this. So you want as much computing capability as possible right at the edge. Uh, It's also true to say that in defence, by its nature, customers want the very latest capability they can get their hands on, whereas other markets might find that they can get the computing power they need at a very low cost, Defence is not like that. 
they, they really want the latest capability. The market we're operating in uh, for our kind of product is billions of dollars in size. And there are standards bodies like VITA, V-I-T-A, who regularly publish the size of the market, who the key players are. And you'll see that the, the three or four biggest players in this market are large, typically American corporates of significant size, and we're competing directly against them wherever we can. A really important thing happened in this market uh, about four or five years ago, so before my time. The US is by far our biggest single country customer, and it's true to say the rest of the world follows what the United States, uh, the direction they take over time. And a statement from the Department of Defence, or initiative from the Department of Defence was, we no longer want to be locked into proprietary architectures. So think Apple, if, you're, if you use an Apple product, as soon as you have an Apple product, you're in their ecosystem and you're likely to stay in their ecosystem perhaps for the rest of your life. And it's been just like that in defence electronics in the United States and around the world for a very long time. And what that meant was the customers got locked into one typically large provider and they were stuck because they were using that provider's interfaces, protocols, standards, all, all of that stuff. So four years ago, the Department of Defence said, no, we're going to have an initiative which is around an open standards, open architecture, where we're no longer dependent on any one company because we can swap and choose as we see fit. That's a huge advantage to a company like us. It's perhaps a threat to a very large incumbent. For a company like us, it opens up the opportunities that would previously have been locked to us, and we can put our products in because we made the decision four years ago to really lean into that initiative and present products to market that complied with that open architecture definition. So quite a lot of the wins that we're securing now are driven by that particular initiative in the United States. A key thing to understand about this business is a lot of our business comes through what we call design wins, back to John's language point. We would, if we win, we get designed into our customers' program during their own design phase for their vehicle, their radar, whatever they're designing. It's confirmed that we're designed in. We don't necessarily get a contract at that time, but then two, three, four years later, when they hit their main production program, that's when we start to get the annual purchase orders at volume. And something we said towards the end of last year, November, I think, was that we had secured something like eight times the number of major design wins last year, where major is something that has the opportunity to deliver better than a million pounds of revenue per annum to us in future years. We, sec we had secured eight by November last year. By the end of the year, it was rather more than that, and I'll definitely communicate that with the full year results. So broadly, that's a tenfold increase in these major design wins, which we will see the benefit of in maybe 26, 2027. So we see it coming from a long way in. That's probably the best leading indicator for this business is when we describe the progress we're making on securing these major design wins into defence. And, and a very good thing about the defence market is typically the, our customers' opportunities are programmes of record, which means the government has published their intention with procuring new product or upgrading existing product. Mm. I suppose the other piece of the narrative around the defence sector you know, that everyone will be familiar with now uh, is we're, we're now two years on from Russia's invasion of Ukraine and obviously the public and political narrative around defence spending levels, ha particularly across Europe, has changed and the, the anticipation is that it's only heading in one direction. I suppose the, the, the more subtle point for investors here is that it's not going to be indiscriminate, is it? You know, it's not. It doesn't mean that there is that defence spending has doubled, or that everyone involved in the defence sector is now going to be, uh, you know, have a sort of booming uh, orders base. I mean, you supply this sector. Have have geopolitical events changed the logic for defence procurement in in the product niche you are in? Have you seen buying appetite or activity levels increase, or is the the nature of the product cycles mean that? You know, two years is actually quite a quite a short window for um, to, to move the needle. It is a short window, and defence budgets, certainly in the West, don't change dramatically year on year. You you can get long term trends, but typically they don't change very quickly, mm. uh, and that's certainly 
more or less true at the moment. Uh, nonetheless, it would be true to say that we know that some of our products have gone into requirements driven by current conditions. Uh, not the majority of, but we, you know, we do see pull on our products to support activities that are happening uh, directly associated with current world events. But those world events in themselves don't turn into a short to medium term game changer for a company like right. us. You know, the, the market we sell into, defence electronics, defence computing, is huge anyway. If you were to go to one of the US-based big trade shows, uh, as I do, uh, you'll find 20,000, 30,000 delegates uh, routinely interested in our kind of technology. And I suppose we should also highlight that, you know, we're talking a lot about defence. It's not the only sector you, you supply, of course. John, I know we've we've talked in, in previous episodes a little bit about the fracturing world in which you're, you know, you're making your investments and, and um, you know, how it serves as a backdrop for, for what you're doing in, in some ways. Has defence always played, has always been a sort of thematic focus of yours as an investor or, or, or is it really a company by company it's very much company by company. I've never really focused on particular sectors. Yeah. Uh, and probably that's been, certainly in the in more recent years, to my detriment. Um, in other words, you know, had I just sort of sat back at the, at the start of the uh, R- uh, Russian invasion of Ukraine uh, and the Western response, um, it was fairly obvious, uh, broad brush, that, that um, you know, there would be a significant boost... Uh, in defence orders, uh, and so it's not surprising, for example, that you know BA Systems, uh, you know, have really had from an investing point of view and quite considerable growth, and I think the shares have more than doubled over the last uh, couple of years. So uh, you know, it, it 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 wasn't rocket science, and yet um, you know, I, I I didn't. I suppose by the same um, token, Kinetic, another big defence company, you know, they've not seen. You know, in share price terms, they've not seen. No, that is that is quite true. And and um, point of fact, I fairly recently came aboard uh, Kinetic because it seemed to me that their uh, valuation price earnings ratio w- was somewhat out of line with the with, you know with the broad sector. Mm. Uh, and uh, you know they have you know performed quite nicely in the in the short term since. But obviously, I've got defence exposure, particularly to um, concurrent. Uh, and also um, slightly more indirectly, but still significantly, very significantly, with Goodwins, which we talked about before, where you know they do a lot of work on submarines and uh, naval vessels. Uh, so um, uh, you know one is very conscious of, of of the macro movements in sectors. But to answer the, your question, really, I tend to, I, the way I've developed my portfolio over the years has been much more focused on individual companies rather than uh, from a sort of a sectoral down approach. And another point you, you, you mentioned in your previous answer, John, around, you know, everything that, that, that Miles has done since he joined. Uh, I just wanted to touch on that. It was a big decision in your, I suppose, in your, your first full year in charge or first uh, accounting cycle in charge was to restate the accounts and treatment of capitalised assets from previous years. I mean, you announced this was happening mid-June last year, with the deadline for, for filing your 2022 figures fast a- approaching. That was obviously sort of taken with some trepidation by the market. You then published those results. Within a few weeks, you know, you post a very strong, strong trading update for the first half of 2023. Things kind of rebounded. How, how What's the feedback been like this? Uh, I suppose it's a bit of a kitchen sinking exercise, but it was you know, you you are you've made it with, I suppose, confidence looking to the future, um, and, and and maybe can you just unpack a little bit the the the, the rationale for for making those restatements. Yeah, it was a it was a challenging audit, mm-hmm. compounded by the fact, which is a positive thing, compounded by the fact we had a new chief executive uh, who joined us as the previously the finance director for Kinetics International okay. Business. So it's clearly. Chief Financial Officer. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's clearly advantageous to her and I yeah. that we had a good clear out. Uh, it's also true to say, though, however, that the auditors realised that prior year accounts had been misstated. So it wasn't a choice. Um, them finding that meant that we absolutely had to restate yeah. previous year's accounts. Uh, that did make the audit even more challenging. So it, you're right, it was the very last day really, that we could possibly announce that we did. Uh, We don't intend to repeat that exercise again this year. 
Uh, indeed, we have a different audit partner this year, and I have to say, extremely pleased with the progress that we're making. John, if, if I may, can I ask you sort of your your thoughts on on that whole process? Obviously, a slightly tricky tricky summer. I mean, were you yes, watching? The, 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 yes, the, the, obviously, when when uh, sort of you know, red lights flash, uh, when that sort of thing ha- happens, uh, you're restating of figures, or you know, there is obvious obvious uh, concern. Um, but um, uh, you know, I I was aboard. I'd taken the decision very much to stay aboard and and um, uh, and back uh, Miles's plans and ambitions, uh, and uh, so uh, I, I was happy to, you know, to continue to watch and and um, uh, hope that uh, we moved through to calmer waters, which thankfully we we have done, uh, and um, you know the, the 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 future looks to me to be. Uh, to be pretty rosy, uh, certainly in terms of uh, all that Tamales has been uh, indicating today. I'd just like to sort of conclude the you know the, uh, sort of chat with a, a final section on 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 maybe sort of experience and, and style. Um, Miles, first of all, I was look, you know, looking through your CV and we were t- talking bef- before um, uh, we we came on. You, you've, you've had management roles at. BAE, Kinetic, two companies we talked about, and, and latterly at Teledyne Technologies, a um, large conglomerate until 2021 when you joined Concurrent. But prior to all of this, you were a scientist. So, you know, your your skill set, is management what you like doing? Is it the getting into the fine grain detail of the products themselves? What's what's What, what do you like doing in your in your job and where are your, where are your skills best applied? I love transformation. So my career has been characterised by being in teams or leading teams that transform uh, their own destiny. I find that process really enjoyable. Uh, yeah, I happen to have a PhD in physics, so I have the ability to be pretty analytical. Uh, I strive to put equal focus on culture as strategy, as operational excellence. Uh, and quite a lot of the way in which I go about designing a business it really drives equal priority to those three things. Uh, in my experience, a lot of managers or leaders have a particular gift at one or two of those. Getting all three of those things right is absolutely critical. Does does concurrent size provide certain advantages to doing that? And and maybe at the same time, I can ask a, a, a kind of contrary question. There, having you know, you've experienced life in larger firms. Are there aspects of of larger businesses that you would like concurrent to emulate or? Build, you know, be it economies of scale or network effects, or those those just come with time. Or what's the? That's a really interesting question. Uh, we are certainly able to make decisions very quickly. I think it's really important to get the best out of the business that you're in. A trap is often getting into the worst of both worlds rather than the best of both worlds. So we're agile. We can make decisions very quickly. We can't uh, make the kind of one-off investments easily that very large companies make. Uh, So we should fight our battles where we're best able to. Quite a lot of the bids that we're submitting at the moment for much more complex, I talked about systems, not just computer boards. Our value proposition there is to say, we might not actually tick the box on every single requirement, but the ones that are most important to you, we'll aim to absolutely be compliant, do a great job, but we'll offer you a lower price alternative where together we figure out how we'll deal with the things that this company can't yet do because we don't have the size and breadth of some of these other very big players. So you, you've got to fight to win. You've got to fight to your own strengths. For sure, I'm finding that our ability to make decisions very quickly is extremely rewarding. Uh, it's good fun. Yeah. John, we've, we've spoken about a real range of companies on this podcast that you've been in, invested in or you've, you've looked at over the years. And some very large in scale, others like Concurrent, which I suppose by comparison are pretty much minnows. I mean, what's... What's the principal appeal to you when you're looking at smaller companies other than, you know, a, good, a greater opportunity, you're supposed to build a relationship with, with, with a company, as I know you like to do? Is it sort of growth potential or can you sort of un- unpack a little Well, bit? The, the relationship is important because obviously, you know, one can build that relationship and the bridge with a chief executive or, or, a, or a chairman uh, in, a, in a small cap stock. Uh, because uh, you know they do get far less coverage and media re- and media attention, and therefore they're much more willing to talk to uh, people like uh, people like me. But I think from a, an investing point of view, uh, it, it really is is you know the 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 opportunity and the potential to grow a a, 
uh, a, you know, a small, a smaller cap company. Mm. And I think what Miles has has indicated uh, today around the table in our in, in our joint interview um, is that, uh, and you've alluded to this, um, Alex, that, that Concurrent at the moment is a, a very small company in a huge sector. So the potential. Uh, for it to grow very substantially, if if it gets everything right, as it were, or the majority of things right, mm-hmm. uh, is really is really is really huge. Whereas you know, if you look at some of the the, the big defence contractors, the the BA Systems, for the sake of argument, yeah. um, you know th- that company is probably going to grow steadily, uh, certainly over the next few years. But I don't think there's going to be the explosive growth that potentially there is uh, in a company like Concurrent uh, if it does get most things right. Uh, and so that's why investing in the small cap stocks can be, uh, you know, very profitable uh, and very exciting. And, um, you know, that's one of the reasons why, you know, I'm very much a board Concurrent. Another mainstay of your investing style, John, we, we've talked about a lot is is dividends. I suppose in Concurrent's case, you, you've, you've you've had to look beyond the, the immediate income case for for a little while now. Miles, I know you said at the interims that you'd consider introducing a dividend at the, the full year. Is that still up for consideration? And, and, and how are you, I suppose, when you're thinking about capital allocation decisions at the moment, how are you balancing this alongside, you know, the many product opportunities you've, you've, you've talked about? I mean, it's, everything has a trade-off. Uh, absolutely. So we've been very clear the last couple of years that we pay dividend out of in-year profit and cash. Mm-hmm. 2022, there was no in-year profit or generate cash. The expectation for 23 does indeed generate both profit and cash. So uh, you know, that should be reason for some optimism. Uh, inevitably, we get very mixed feedback from investors, current and potential investors, for all the way from your growth stock, why would you pay a dividend, to the dividend is fundamentally important, don't change anything. Uh, what we have said is it's not in our interest to shock anybody. Uh, over time, as we grow, we may or may not develop a little bit of a trend. Uh, I'm not trying to lead anything there, but sure. but what I'm saying is we won't do anything suddenly that shocks anybody. So you know, expect us to honour the current understanding, which is that we pay dividends from in-year profit and cash. Yeah, OK. Um, judging by last year's fundraising for Philips Aerospace, we, we touched on briefly, I mean, you, I mean you're obviously... There is a good deal of trust there on the on the face of it, with you know, with your relationship with shareholders, that you're able to tap them for cash at you know, I imagine fairly short notice. I don't know how these things always play out, but um, you had a retail offer part of that component, so that would have been fairly short notice. It did seem that this also avoided the need for for debt financing. Are you, are you cap, is the business capital constrained at all at the moment? Do you feel you have confidence to go to either debt or equity capital markets? if required, to, to do anything which might require a larger amount of cash than you currently have available to Yes, we, we were pleasingly oversubscribed for the equity raise. We raised rather more than we needed for the acquisition, uh, the reason being the acquisition in itself isn't our only route to developing this systems business, and indeed Philips Aerospace will need investment, potentially a new facility. So we raised more than we necessarily needed. Uh, so we have we have that available to us. We don't have a debt facility currently, and the time around I joined in 2022 was absolutely the wrong time to try and get a debt facility. Mm -hmm. Uh, We are exploring that now. And what we do have is pleasing amounts of interests from non-holders, whether institutional or retail. So I think our ability, assuming we continue to deliver as signalled, our ability to raise money through the markets, I'm pretty optimistic about. Okay. Great stuff, and uh, I mean, I'm, I'm guessing it's not going to be down to the wire this year. I mean, do you got an uh, idea when uh, full year results are going to be out in the market, kind of on a month by month basis? Or are you still working working timings out? I don't think there's anything uh, disclosed m- yet. Nothing disclosed okay. yet. We will disclose as soon as we can. But uh, as far as I'm concerned, the process is going quite well. John, I've really enjoyed this experiment of a, a kind of like a dual dual interview. I mean, is there anything you know? Mar- I suppose Mars is technically your uh, employee in some ways, isn't <laughs> it? You could. You, are there any things you'd, you'd like to ask uh, uh, ask him as as you have him here? I suppose on the, either on the outlook or anything we've not explored. I don't think I don't think there are any particular questions that um, are uh, unanswered. I, you know, I've always found uh, Mars, you know, very open and very 
very frank uh, mm -hmm. uh, about what he inherited and uh, uh, and what his plans are. Uh, and, um, uh, you know, all that I've heard uh, being alongside him today just, you know, adds to the, uh, the overall uh, encouragement. And uh, I think that... Um, but I'm just glad I'm aboard, put it yeah. that way. Yeah. Uh, and uh, it's not for me to encourage others to. They will you know, form their own form their own view. But I, I would think that uh, the company has got a very exciting future and uh, in five years' time uh, is going to be, I think and hope, um, a you know, much more substantial and, and, and better-known uh, better business. I mean, who can project beyond this, as it were, but um, uh, you know, I wouldn't say that the sky's the limit. It's not a phrase that one uses in in, in the investment uh, investment world. But um, the opportunities uh, in this in this sector and and um, uh, Miles' uh, experience and, and quiet ambition uh, to me um, you know, indicate that um, shareholders will be uh, will be fairly richly rewarded. I hope. Whether whether when you get to my age and stage, as it were, whether I will see the benefit or my my heirs and beneficiaries, I'm not quite sure. But um, uh, I, I'd be quite happy if, if they did well. Um, but I'd like to do do fairly well myself in the in the shorter term. You know, there's obviously going to be a little time until we have the uh, you know the full story in the 2023 20, um, figures. So you've got a little time to wait until a, a concurrent releases. There, John. What are you, what what are your uh, the next few weeks uh, looking like for you? I suppose both in your portfolio and, uh, and beyond. Before we uh, next speak, well, um, uh, just putting concurrent to, to you know to one side, mm -hmm. and obviously I'm pleased that you know the, the shares have been gently rising in anticipation of uh, uh, a good story associated with the results. Um, I suppose that. It, it, Two main, two main aspects. Firstly, of course, uh, on the dividend flow, it's been obviously a, a fairly lean period uh, at the start of the year mm -hmm. uh, because the, there aren't many companies whose year end is say October, November. But of course, the the we're coming into the period where the December year ends start to report. So next month, for example, early in March, some of my big dividend generating holdings like M and G. Uh, and I suspect Aviva and um, Legal and General um, uh, will be reporting. And so, you know, the dividend flow in April, May, June from those December year ends, you know, will be uh, particularly important. Um, so that, in, in a sense, is, is um, you know, something personal to me. But the more important, uh, the, the, the more, more important um, event coming up, I suppose, in the short term, as far as we can tell, and there are always unexpected events, will be the budget on March the 6th. Obviously, the Chancellor's been under uh, some considerable pressure to do something to stimulate um, investment in the UK economy uh, and to put a bit more life into the UK stock market. So there have been suggestions as to, um, as to you know, maybe a, uh, a new type of ISA, which is focused on British stocks rather than uh, allowing, you know, the broader, uh, broader range uh, in something like the, the, the ISA. Um, but uh, Chancellor may well have, um, you know, one or two, one or two other things, one or two rabbits to pull out of the the hat. We shall we shall see. So I think the the budget could be quite interesting from from every point of view, not least the political one. Yeah. Um, so the combination budget and also big dividend flow coming in. You know, the results, for example, uh, from M and G to me will, will be important because it's my biggest holding at the at the present time. Um, so. Uh, uh, you know, we will we will see. But um, looking a few years ahead, I'm hoping that uh, concurrent will take over and the number <laughs> one the number one slot from M and G. Yeah, loads to explore in our next episode. Um, you know, which of course can include any questions you'd like to put to to, to John, which you can do by emailing me at alex.newman at ft.com. Until then, all that's left for me to say is to thank you for listening. Thank you so much, Miles, for coming into the studio today. It's been great talking to you and learning about the business. Thank you, John, as ever, for your thoughts. And to thank our producer, Maddie Apthorpe, for all her work behind the soundboard. Until next time.